have excuses or reasons, we're busy, we don't do it. Just There's a lot of reasons why we don't do it, but the fact is we don't always do it. And if, if I said, hey, come, I'll come here tomorrow and I'll meet you here at 12 o'clock, go out and have six to eight conversations, write your names down on a piece of paper of the, of the folks you had conversations with, and I'll meet you here at 12. Okay, if you hand me a piece of paper with six to eight names on it, I'll give you a hundred bucks. How many of us would go get our six to eight conversations done tomorrow, right? Yeah, exactly. Everybody would. Everybody would. Thank you. Several people would be straight. Yeah, right? In fact, people would be here early waiting for me, saying, hey, you know, I've been waiting for you. you know? So if we, did our, if we did that every day, our business, the rest of the business would take care of itself. So just having six to eight conversations on a daily basis, just asking people to buy or sell. The other thing that makes it easier is having systems in place that help you do this. Systems drive leads to you so that you're not having to chase leads. You have them coming in, inbound, that's what systems do. And what you're looking at here is systems. When I got into residential real estate and I did the 100 deals a year, everything was systemized. And then I got into commercial real estate and I said, hey, where's the systems for this? And where's the systems for that? And there were really no systems, and so, as you guys all know. And so I started putting systems in place as fast as I could and customize them for commercial real estate. And that's what you're looking at there. The grid system is a method of getting listings on the market, off the market, pocket listings. And it's a unique way of doing it too, which I really didn't understand when I first got into commercial real estate. Now I know it's a unique way of getting listings. The internet system, what do you think we get mostly from the internet? Buyers or sellers? Buyers. Buyers. I have, how much time here? No, oh, half an hour, okay. So, uh, buyer. So what I do is I double end a lot of my transactions using those two systems, okay? Now again, what a system does is it saves yourself time, energy, and money because you're not doing it. It's automatically happening for you. And that's what we're talking about. That's what makes, that's what makes it a system. Sphere referral is an automated way of getting referrals sent to you. Let's face it. We don't ask for referrals as much as we're supposed to. We know we're supposed to do it, but we don't always do it as much as we're supposed to do it. So I'm talking about automating it so it happens automatically. Who stops us from having all the business that we want in our lives, you guys? Ourselves. We do, see? And so when we, when we own it and say, okay, I realize I'm the problem here, then I can fix it. But if I keep saying, it's not me, it's my market, it's my office, it's my broker, if I keep doing that, then I can never really fix the real problem. So that's what we're talking about doing here is automating it. Now I like to have, suggest that you have these three, one for sellers, one for buyers, one for referrals. So these are constant, and then we're changing this fourth system around depending on the market that we're in. So the fourth system stands for market of the moment, MM. Maybe it's a press release system or a uh, marketing system because the market's been really strong in a seller's market where what's starting to happen now? What are we entering into? Buyers. More of a buyer's market. It's kind of slowing down a little bit, tapering off, as, it, as we expected, right? It was a cycle where it's been about a 10 year cycle. So it's probably going to be another, you know, balancing, you know, leveling off. And who knows how long it will last, but we can expect that it's probably going to last for a while. So don't be afraid of that. Just adjust. Now we start moving into other types of systems. Maybe even it becomes short sales and REOs, expires. Those are starting to show up again and will probably continue to show up and make it even heavier. So as you do that, you can set up systems to get in front of the markets that are out there. And that's what we're talking about doing here is tracking the key indicators. And then when you feel it starting to shift, start to get in front of it, shift ahead of it. That's what I'm suggesting you do. And that's what these four systems will do. And then it drives leads to you so you can have these conversations that are a little easier, make it a little easier to have. The second, uh, law is having a budget. A budget just should be about 10% for marketing, 10% for going after new business, not your office and you know and your stuff, you know your your uh, our cars and things like that, but just pure marketing. 10% of the GCI that I want to have this year, that I expect to have this year, that should be our budget for marketing. Think about it for a minute. You know, I run into agents a lot. I just, or I coach agents a lot and. They'll say things like, well, you know, I don't have any money, or I don't want to lead generate. And I'm thinking, well, I don't say it, but I'm thinking in my head, well, this doesn't sound like a business to me. Uh, think about it. I'm going to open up a real estate company. Let me see what you guys think of my new model. My new model is I'm going to open up a real estate company, but I don't want to lead generate. 
And for as a broker owner, we lead generate by recruiting. But I don't want to recruit anybody. I don't want to lead generate. And I don't want any expenses. So I don't want to have an office space and lease and copy machines and uh, computers and front desk and phones and things. I don't want to have any of that stuff. Not that you guys want to come to my new office, right? Sound like a good model? <laughs> Probably not, right? See, and so, but yet as an agent, we, not you guys, but by the way, as I'm going through these laws, I have a tendency to start talking about what we're not doing correctly, okay? And, and because we're not doing these laws. And I'm not referring to you guys in this room when I'm saying that. I'm referring to all those agents out there that are not in class, okay? That's what I'm referring to. Those agents out there, they have a tendency to say things like, well, you know, I don't want to lead generate or I don't want to have expenses. And those two things are key to our business. So you, you don't want to spend everything you've got, but you want to spend about 10% of your GCI. Number three, the next law is delegating. Delegating. Boy, that's a big one, isn't it? Delegating. Delegating. Write that down. The four high dollar activities you get paid to do. List, sell, negotiate, excuse me, prospect. Those are the four high dollar activities that you get paid to do. Let's see what happens there. a little bit. List, sell, negotiate, and prospect. Those are the four things that you get paid to do. I did some numbers and I ran some numbers and figured, if you want to make $100,000 in extra income, and you're going to work 45 hours a week, and you want to take some time off and have, you know, work like 48 hours of the year, 48 weeks of the year, I mean, 48 weeks, 45 hours a week, and have some time off, well, you need to make about $45 an hour to do that. 45 bucks an hour just to make an extra $100,000 using those numbers I just used. So when somebody says, oh, Michael, you know, I, 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 I don't have time, I need to work on this flyer. You know, I need to work on this escrow because I don't believe in transaction coordinators, TCs. I'm thinking in my head, well, you're choosing at this moment to do $10 an hour stuff, maybe even $4 an hour stuff. The virtual assistants that are out there, you guys now, I have several coaching members that are using them, three bucks an hour, four bucks an hour, and it used to be that we have training issues and management issues with these folks because a lot of them are overseas and language barriers. But now they're really coming a long ways because they're realizing the real estate agents, you know, they don't want to spend a lot of money to play the can, that they don't delegate real well. So they know there's a niche there. So you can get some help, you can get talent for really inexpensive. So when I say 45 bucks an hour to make an extra 100,000 a year, Anytime you are doing activities that are not $45 an hour or more, you're making the decision saying, hey, I don't care about my goal right now, okay? So again, getting back to who's the reason why we're not getting all the business that we have, all we have to do is look at your schedules, right? Look at our calendars. Whenever someone comes to me and says, oh, my business is kind of low, I'll say, let's take a look at what you're doing. What are you, what are your, what's your schedule? Do you have a schedule? And by the way, what's usually the answer to that? don't even have a schedule, right? And so that's that's not a good idea, just getting up and winging it, just letting the, letting, letting other people choose the day that we're going to have. That's not a good idea. Get up, have a plan, lead generate, follow your plan, and stick to that plan. And again, the rest of your business will take care of yourself, take care of itself, and stick to these things. List, sell, negotiate, prospect. You know, you guys need to list, you need to be the listing agents that list at a high level because nobody can list like you guys can usually, unless you have a listing manager. Sell, nobody can really sell like you guys can unless you have a good buyer's agent. Prospect, nobody can really lead generate prospect like you guys can unless you have telemarketers or some sort of prospecting mechanisms of uh, digitally, uh, social media, things like that. So those are the things, and negotiate, you guys are great negotiators, and so those are things that you need to do unless you have something that's really, really good at doing those things, that's what you get paid to do. So if I start looking at calendars and schedules, I, I don't see this. I see usually the other stuff. You know, 80% of the time is being spent on the stuff and maybe 10% of the day is being spent on this. So it's backwards and that's why the, why the business, the volume is off. So those are the four high dollar activities that you get paid to do. I remember the first time I hired my assistant. I had an assistant early, early 90s and I realized if I was going to continue to grow my business, I needed to hire an assistant. And I don't come from a background of money. Um, I got started with credit cards, basically. 
in the business. And so I was scared. I, I'll be honest, I was really nervous about doing it because I'm thinking, you know, this gal is going to come in and I'm going to start paying her and, you know, I don't know if I can do this. So I was really scared to do it. And so I started looking at my desk because we had a shared desk and I started saying, well, so what's she going to do so I can make sure she's really, really busy? I know, she can do that. And I slid that stuff over to her side of the desk and I looked over and said, wait a minute, she can do that too. And I slid that stuff over to her side of the desk and then I said, you know what, she can also do all of this. And I, Let me slide all that over to her side of the desk. And then I looked at my side of the desk and it was empty. So what did I need to do in the morning when I came in? List sell negotiate prospect. See, all that stuff over there is excuses for me not wanting to make the money that I really say I want to make. That's all it is. See, and so I brought it in and I delegated it to her. And guess what? I, I had to get over the perfectness of the way I was doing things, which is another thing that we have a tendency to do sometimes. Nobody can make the tea like I can. You know, I have a certain swirl on it, right, that is so special. Well, guess what happens? You hire somebody who's talent. And then they start doing the tea just like you. They start actually doing it better than you. And then you're not doing it anymore, right? You're doing this stuff. And so that's what we're talking about doing is just delegating. Virtual assistants, I mentioned that. Transaction coordinators. You know, if we're not using TCs in this business, I, I, don't, I don't know why we wouldn't do that. I just don't get it. You know, the, the TCs, they do hundreds of deals a month in some cases, hundreds of files. My transaction coordinators are way better at paperwork than I will ever be. And so who should be handling that paperwork? Well, probably not me, because I'm not really good at it. I'm better off having that TC handle it. Now I'm responsible for her, and I have to keep her accountable, of course, but I don't need to be involved in a lot of that stuff. So those are some things that you really should consider and think about. Number four is having a value proposition, a unique selling proposition. A unique selling proposition is really important, something that separates you from everybody else. It's something that's grabbing the consumer with messages that is separating you from everybody else. Um, do you happen to have a written real estate investment plan, for example, is an example of a, of a unique selling proposition. I've got so many of them here. So I'm a certified real estate investment planning specialist, and I help people achieve goals faster through written real estate investment planning strategies. Items of value. Commercial agents have so much value that you can bring and give to people. And when I say give to people, what we're doing, what I'm suggesting is consulting instead of selling. Instead of calling people and asking them to sell, hey, I drove by your property, I got a buyer for it, I was wondering if you'd like to sell sometime soon. Who's that about? Is that about me or them? It's really about me. I'm calling and asking them to sell. It's all pretty much about me. And that's exactly what that owner is thinking. And another one of these commercial agents calling me, asking me to sell my property. And all they care about is commission, right? That's what, what's going through their head. Where in a lot of cases where if you call and it's all about them, and if you think about it, you can be strategic, really strategic on calling these owners and saying, hey, you know, here's a property that just sold around down the street from you and tell them about the property that just sold. Or here's a property that just came up for sale. Or, you know, here's uh, some information that Omni put together on some contamination in the area I just wanted to share with you. And then the sky's the limit. You guys have so much knowledge and so much experience that you can bring to them that's about them. And then I think you'll find, some of you guys probably do this, but you'll find that when you consult, you get back faster than when you sell. And that's what I'm suggesting that we do, is we consult instead of sell and get business faster. And then we're using unique selling propositions to, to demonstrate that. If I can show you how, if I can show you how to, how to own 40 units in 15 years instead of the 10 you now own, would that be of interest to you? See, so things like that. And so I know I, I don't have all this in your in your handout, and, and, I, and I know it's a lot to write. So if you are interested in some of this stuff, come see me You know, after the class, and I'll, I'll give you a copy of this or whatever. I'll sell your property in 90 days, or I'll buy it. I'll, I'll, I'll save you 100000 on your next purchase, or I'll give you my commission. The grid system, uh, using return on equity, ROE, and showing folks how their return on equity diminishes when they're sitting on a bunch of equity. Uh, if those are things that you don't understand, if you don't, if you're sitting in this room and you don't understand that when somebody's sitting on a bunch of equity, what happens is you purchase a property, 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. But when you get hit that 50 percent mark, that return starts to diminish. It's called diminishing ROE. 
And I have slides and things that I can show you and explain to you what, what's happening and how that is happening. But if you don't understand that, you're really missing out on a huge, huge benefit to why people should exchange into something else. So there's a lot of these that I suggest that you use, but having a unique selling proposition is real important, right? Would you guys agree with that? When you run into an investor and they, and they, and they introduce themselves to you, do you say something to them that separates you from everybody else? Yes or no? Yeah, you should. Yeah, you should, right? We all should be saying something that's separating us from instantly from somebody else. And that's what you really need to work on, in my opinion. If you don't have that, that's something you should absolutely have because that's a, that's kind of a uh, uh, kind of a no-brainer for you. Write this down: eighty-five percent of the people you meet are a complete waste of time. Eighty-five percent of the people you meet are a complete waste of time. They're nice people. They're just never really going to do anything. They're never going to buy. They're, you know, they're heading west, heading east, looking for the sunset, right? Heading east, looking for the sunset, the sun <laughs> sets to the west. Anyway, um, 85%. So what I like to do is I like to interview. I like to talk to people and see, is this one of the 15% that I actually want to do something work with that's going to do something? Or is this one of the 85 percenters that's never going to do anything? And that's what this process is about, is trying to determine who that is. So how do you do that? You have rules, you have hoops that they have to jump through. What, 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 would, be some, what would be some examples of rules? You have a rule that you guys use, or a, a, a hoop that you make people go through before to pre-qualify them? Show me the money. Show you the money, okay. So you'll have them show you funds, proof of funds, things like that. Okay, anything else that you do? Go ahead. Ask great questions, right? Frequent, you're screening them. You're trying to figure out, right? How about uh, if we got together with them and said, hey, let's get together. What is the conversion rate on when we send list of properties to people, especially that we've never met? What is our conversion rate in the room? You guys are all great commercial agents in here. What's your conversion rate on that? Maybe 1%. Maybe 1%, right? Maybe on a good day. It just doesn't work, right? So taking lists of properties and just sending them to people is probably not a good use of time. I, I don't think, my experience has not been positive with, with doing that. So why do we do that? Why not, why not have language that we use to help control that situation so that we are not doing those things? So instead of them, when they say something like, hey, can you send me a list of properties? Here's an example. So when you, contact, when you run into somebody, you're on the phone with them. Controlling the conversation is something that we should all do. Okay, so just a simple phone call. Here's what happens a lot of times. Um, oh, hi, it's Michael. Oh, I was calling about that property down the street. What can you tell me about it? Well, what's the address? Oh, it's 123 Main Street. And what's the price? Uh, 10.5 million. And what's the cap rate? Four. What's the square footage? Um, it's just over 500,000 square feet. And what's the lot size? Just over an acre. And what's the year built? 1975. And now what happens when I give all the information to the person, what do they do? Wait, thank you very much, and they go somewhere else. So what we should really consider doing is controlling that conversation and by, with scripts and things like that, by saying, hi, it's Michael. Oh, I was calling about the property on the street. Well, what can I tell you about that? Uh, what's the price? Oh, it's 10.5 million. What price are you looking for? Oh, what's the cap rate on that? Oh, uh, why, let me look that up for you, sir or ma'am. And what cap rate are, are you looking for? What's important to you about your next investment purchase. Are you only looking at properties that are on the market or are you looking for a good deal? Now, what are they going to say to that? Looking for a good deal. Are they looking for properties that are on the market usually? Yes or no? No. Usually not, right? Because they usually have access to LoopNet. They have access in some cases to CoStar. They don't need a license to access those properties. So a lot of times what they're looking for is properties that are not on the market. So what are they thinking right now when you ask that question? Are you only looking at properties that are on the market or are you looking for a good deal? What are they thinking? You have something that I want, right? So now that consumer is contacting you thinking, oh, let me get as much information as I can from this person and get away as quick as I can, is now thinking, wait a minute, that's exactly what I'm looking for. How can I get those properties? So they might say something like, can you send those to me? Well, we already agreed that the conversion rate is maybe 1% on doing that. So that's probably not the best thing to do. So why not say something like, well, 
trying to get them to self-discover what they need to do, why don't we say something like, well, you know, those properties are not on the market. There's no agreement there. See, and try to get them to realize, oh, wait a minute, okay, I need to do something with this agent to get this information. And that something is usually, let's get together. It could be, and get together is for me, I'm busy too. It could be a Skype meeting, it could be Zoom.us. A lot of times, I don't know if you guys have ever used that tool, it's a great tool, Zoom.us. You just, a lot of times I'll be on the phone with somebody and I'll log into Zoom, open it up, create a link, I'll send it to them, and I'll say, hey, click that link real quick and we'll be on a video conference. You know, and as long as their hair is not all messed up or something like that, I don't have to worry about that. Then they'll click it, you know, and they'll be on a video conference with you. Is a video conference better than just a phone call? Yes. Yeah. So we could do that. We could send them a confidentiality agreement or NDAs or NCNDAs and things like that to protect the commission, right? And then send them properties that are not on the market. But why just send it to them? Because if, if and by the way, if they won't get together with you, and or they won't sign something that's going to protect your commission. What percent is that person? Zero. What percent of the 85 or the 15? 85. It's 85. So see what I'm what we're doing here is we're just saying, hey, let's just have some simple suggestions and rules that we have people follow, or we don't work with them because why do we? Are we? Is this a nonprofit business? <laughs> right? No, we you guys are in the business of getting paid, and I've been doing this for about 30 years. And I, I've been burned, you know, we've all been burned, and I've seen agents get burned and used over and over again, and I'm tired of it. I want to see you get paid for the hard work that you guys do. And so here's a way to do that, is just kind of screen them and determine which way, which one they are, okay? Is that helpful for you? Yes. Okay. So let me recap real quick. Uh, number one, how many conversations should we have on a daily basis? Six to eight. And what's the expenses that we should consider using? About ten percent, and we should delegate uh, for sure. Delegate. Gosh, if we're not, if we're not the assistant, if we don't have an assistant, we kind of are one. You know, we really should do that. By the way, real quick on this, this is such a big deal for me because it's changed my life. Leverage has absolutely changed my life. Now I've over leveraged to the point where uh, where I've had people that if they leave or go, or go get sick, I'm like, I have no idea. You know, so that's I've kind of I'm yeah, I've gotten better at that now. I fixed that. But I definitely don't do stuff anymore. Uh, and don't look at a hire as a as a 12 month hire. Okay, oh my gosh, I'm gonna pay him, you know, 60 grand a year or whatever. Oh, it's such a, you know, it's a big number. Look at it as, you know, maybe in 90 days. And I like to sit down with, with talent like Nicole back there and my business grow. And I'm gonna take care of you, you know, but I need you to help my business grow. Don't just, you know, Treat it as a nine to five job. It's just a job. Let's let's do this. Let's grow this company together. And when you do, I'll take care of you. But listen, if it's not growing, or if you're not really treating it that way and helping it grow, then you know after nine days you're gonna have a review, and this might not work out. See, so I'm looking at that as a not a twelve month commitment, but really a ninety day. Well, it'll commitment. work out though. <laughs> I know it will because you've got the right gal. See, and that's the other thing is you find somebody who's talented, and that's exactly what'll happen. They'll say this will work out. Let me show you. And they'll help you. I remember my first assistant was really good at that. She would say, Michael, what, what are you doing that for? Here, here, let me take that from you. Here, let me do that. I'll get that done. Go, go, go get me some new business, right? And at first, it's kind of like, well, who are you to you know, push me around like that? But it's exactly what I need. I need somebody to kick my butt and make me go out there and get more, more business. So it was really helpful. I, I appreciate it. All right, and then four is we have a USP, a unique selling proposition. Five, we have rules that we like to have people follow. And six is model, model. Follow people who are going, who have already gone where you wanna go and just do what they say. Have you ever seen the agent that um, uh, is, a, let's say it's a new agent, and I see this a lot in our offices, and they'll go to a top listing agent, and they'll say, hey, Christian, I hear you're, you're a great listing agent. Um, I hear listings are a good way to go. How do you go about getting listings? And then Christian tells them how he does it, how they might consider doing it. And then they go to somebody else and they say, hey, I hear you're a really good agent. How do you how do you get listings? And they ask that agent another question. They come over here and they ask another agent, hey, how do you go about getting listings? And how do you go about getting listings? What are they doing? They're getting ready to get ready to get ready to get ready, right? Just take action. Just follow some, find somebody who's gone where you want to go already and just follow them and go do what they say. I remember when I first started in real estate, I 
latched on to the number one agent in the office and said, you know, I'll be a sponge. Just tell me what to do. I'll, I'll do whatever you say to do. And then I got into commercial real estate and I had a mentor and a coach that, and I said, hey, just tell me what to do and I'll, I'll do it. Exactly what you say. Now I didn't listen to him <laughs> and I failed uh, miserably and I almost lost everything. In fact, that's all that's in my book. Um, but then I, I got smart when he, when he, just, he kind of smacked me inside the head a little bit and I said, he asked me if I was ready to listen now. And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm hurt and bad, I'm ready to listen. So then I listened and I succeeded. And then I opened up the franchises. I, I didn't know how to open up a real estate office. I've never done that. Why would I try to figure all that out when, when there's people out there succeeding at a high level? So I went to the top folks in the company and said, hey, tell me what you're doing, show me how to do it. And of course these folks, they love to help. They love to support and train and mentor. So you don't need to figure everything out on your own. Repeat after me on the count of three that people have gone before. Okay, ready? One, two, three. People, people have, have gone, gone before. before. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. So that's a big deal. Model other folks and take action and have the discipline to do it. And then having confidence in our business. What is it? What does a doctor do? Say what? Doctor practices, right? Doctor practices is very diligent. Doctor is not the head nurse. What does the doctor do that's different than the head nurse? Make decisions, trains people, ask questions. Doctors are really good at asking questions. The other thing that doctors do is think about it. How many patients do they see on a daily basis? A lot. They come in, head nurse does all the stuff. They come in, they ask questions, they diagnose, they go to the next patient. They don't mess around with the stuff. They have other people doing all those stuff, all the stuff. A doctor is usually very confident, too. Have you ever noticed that? Doctors are, and if we don't have a confident doctor, is that is that, is that uh, comforting for us? Probably not. So we want a, com a confident doctor that's gonna say, look, I got this, I'm gonna do this, I've been doing this for a long time, I got you, I'm gonna take care of you. Our business should be the same way. We should be very confident as real estate agents and we should take control of our business and operate it as a business. A lot of times I see agents letting the consumer tell them how to do their business. Now, by the way, whose business is it? Is it our business or is it their business? Our. It's our business. In a lot of cases, I know certainly in my case, I do a great job and I've got a lot of testimonials and customers that have send referrals to me over and over again, and my numbers, you know, I'm a top agent, so I'm certainly doing something right. So I don't need some consumer off the street to tell me how to operate my business because I think I've got it dialed in pretty good. If I'm gonna to listen to anybody, it's gonna be somebody who's doing more volume than I'm doing or somebody that I really respect in the industry. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Awesome, all right, so we control that business and we treat it like a business, and that's number seven. The last thing that I'll end with you guys, yeah, how are you? Good to see you, man, good to see you. I was just raving and ranting about you guys and how, yeah, about, uh, <laughs> she's like, you're gonna be listening for. No, I was just tell, telling how you boys supported me here, so thank you, good, great team, we appreciate it. Last thing, you guys, I'm trying to be respectful of your time, I'm speaking and talking really fast, uh, is, don't be so serious. You know, this is, this is we're not curing cancer here. Have balance in your lives. I can't tell you how often I see a agent and they say, oh my gosh, I haven't had a vacation in, in two years or three years. And I'm thinking, what in the world are you thinking? Why are you doing that? You know, our, when we're on our deathbed, are we gonna say, oh, I wish I would have done one more commercial deal? Probably not, right? We're probably not gonna say those things. So have some balance, uh, live your lives. And like Christian said to me, uh, does that sound about right? And I corrected him and said, well, it sounds about right, except it's family first for me, right? It's, it's I'm, gonna, I'm gonna live my life the way I wanna live it, take care of my family, have some balance, have some fun, and follow my dreams. And my business is going to fund my ability to do that. And that's the way I, I think these days. I didn't always think that way. I was, I was the other way when I was younger. And that was not a good way to, to live, I don't, I don't believe. So um, hopefully this, I decided to do something a little different today instead of come in and do strategies or systems or some sort of numbers with you. I felt like you guys all know that stuff already. Um, and so I just wanted to do something a little different with some mindset. So hopefully this has been okay for you guys in this short period of time. Yes. Awesome. Any questions for Michael? Questions? Yes.
investor, and it was a 2% return on the deal before taxes, uh, cash on cash return. And the investor stopped me right in the middle of it, and he said, whoa, wait a minute, 2%? Michael, why am I buying this thing again? Well, what happens if we don't have the answer to that? They're not gonna buy. And so I said, remember the benefits of owning real estate. The benefits of owning real estate are taxes saved, interest paid, principal reduction, and depreciation. When you take those things into consideration, your return is actually much, much higher. And then I showed him how that's calculated. And I went through that whole process with him and showed him that. And so what we do is, you guys probably know this, you, you take the NOI, you subtract the interest paid, you amortize a loan, and turn around and say, of that loan, how much is going towards principal, how much is going towards interest. You can do that in any given year. So all I'm doing here is showing that the first year, that's how much is interest. And then we depreciate the property. Do we depreciate the land or the building? The building. So I'm using the straight line method, depreciating it over 27 and a half years to calculate the taxes. Then I plug the taxes in, add in the principal reduction, which is the amount of loan that's going towards principal. And now I have my total after tax return and the return is 7.97. And so I said, your return is actually 7.97, it's almost eight. How do you feel now about buying the property? And the investor said, oh yeah, I knew all that, Michael, keep going, right? And so there's three different types of return, before tax, after tax, and then IRR, internal rate of return. So I, I talk about that in these classes and, and go through that and explain what it means to the investor. So it's one thing to know it, it's another thing to explain the benefits to the investor. Uh, this is what happens when somebody sits on equity. This is the doctor's scenario. So this is the real scenario. The doctor bought the property for a million dollars, his loan was 750, his equity was 250,000, cash flow was 25,000. Well, the value went from a million to a million and eight. Is it realistic for a property to go from a million to a million and eight? Yeah, it's a matter of time. Loan goes to 650, equity went to 1,150,000, cash flow essentially doubles. So when people call this doctor and say, hey, I've got a buyer for you, you can plan in a, you plan to sell anytime soon, because I just drove by the property. Well, the doctor's thinking, gosh, I'm sitting on all this cash flow, why would I sell this property? Well, the reason you should consider it is because he's actually losing money, his return is diminished. So I have in my three-day training events, I have an analysis that I was taught to do. It's a snapshot past 12 months of the building of the property. It's going to tell them everything they want to know, the interest paid, the principal reduction, their depreciation, pretty much everything they want to know about their property. And I put the analysis together, and then I come and I show this person what's happening on that property. The shortcut is you take the cash flow and you divide it by the equity, and it's a 10% return. Well, now you take the 50,000 divided by 1 million, and it's a 4% return. So that return is diminished. It's gone from 10 to four. It's gonna go from four to three to two until this doctor does what? Sell, so, exchanges, right? Puts that money back to work over there. So you've heard the term debt equity, right? That's what that is. That's just money sitting in the property not doing anything, it's debt equity. So in theory, if I own a $2 million property, just to wrap up, a $2 million property and I owe a million, <coughs> what am I at equity percentage wise? percentage-wise, 50%. So in theory, when I buy a property, 20, 30, 40, 50%, I'm doing good up until 50%. Then once I hit that number, I start to diminish and my return goes backwards. But a lot of people don't understand that the return is going backwards, so we don't talk about it much. So when I, once you have somebody, this could be a single family home, free and clear, this could be a duplex, I mean, it's any type of property. Once somebody understands, oh, I'm actually losing money, my return's going backwards. This is becoming a logical decision, it's not emotional. What do I do? And then the, the logical thing to do is exchange into something else. So that's the quick version you know, of diminishing ROE for you. Is that helpful for you? Yes. Okay, if you wanna learn how to have these conversations and do this kind of stuff, this is extremely effective. I, I promise you this stuff converts to deals. If you want to learn that stuff, come to my three-day, come see me, and we'll get you involved in that three-day class, okay? All right. Go multiple times. Thanks again for you guys' time today. Appreciate it. So thank you, Michael, uh, for doing this.